Alternative 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. Now your host, Steve Jaw and the Art of War coaches. Welcome everyone, welcome aboard for part two, part two of a wonderful episode. I am John Lennon, your host for Art of War. If perhaps you did not listen to part one, that was where Jack Harpster and I, my fellow Art of War coach, sat down and wrote a Craftworld Eldar list. Brand spanking new, we wrote it on air, specifically for him to take to Adepticon. So if you didn't listen to part one, well, you're missing out on half the fun. Go check out part one, come right back here, and then... We're going to talk about how Jack is going to be playing this army against the top meta builds right now and what it's going to look like on the tabletop. Jack, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Ready? Awesome. All right. So let's let's kind of talk about where this list is going. Let's actually talk about Adepticon for a second. Um, yeah, let's let's run through the list real fast just for people who may not remember from part, uh, yeah, re- from read part it off one. Quick. Just power through that thing. You know, maybe part one was on their commute to work, and this is their commute back from work. You never know. So, real fast, uh, this is a patrol and a, an outrider. It has the avatar. It has Eldrad. It has a farseer on bike. It with um, the spirit helm. Eldrad is actually the warlord with keep an extra fate die. And that has Bahroth in there. It has five rangers with a wire weave net. It has a warlock on bike with uh, with quicken and restrain and sunstorm and then it has a warlock on foot with protect and jenks and weeping stones for roll an extra die for strands of fate has three shining spears with an exarch with heart strike a um paragon saber a shimmer shield and a shirking cannon it has four shroud runners ten swooping hawks uh with the relic of feel no pain for pinvon on the sergeant uh, it has two solo vipers with scatter lasers. It has two units of five warp spiders with an extra spinner on the sergeant as a knight spinner and two units of shadow weavers. Um, quite solid. The Farseer has Executioner, Crushing Orb, and Doom. Eldred has Gain and CP, which I believe is called Faithful Divergence, um, as well as Fortune and Guide. Okay, quite a lot here, quite a lot to unpack. Of course, we already unpacked a lot of it in part one, so let's go ahead and talk about the Adepticon format. Uh, Namely, we don't actually know much about the terrain for this, right? We don't. I've heard that past Adepticons were on the lighter side, Um, but we'll see. I mean, this this list does like a lot of terrain, but it is a shooting list, so if if your opponent doesn't have a lot of terrain, you can just blow them up. So that, that does help. Um, a lot of it is closer range, like the warp spiders are a bit closer range, but you know, they move real fast. They shoot real hard. So you don't want to just, you don't want to be on the receiving end of that. If you can avoid it. Did that factor at all into the style of list that you want to build? The fact that like, you know, compared to like a frontline gaming event or GW event, we didn't actually know what the terrain was going to look like going in. We, we really don't. Um, this is more of a generalist build. It has a lot of shooting power, but it also kind of does its does a lot of mortal wounds, and it also has some decent combat between the Avatar, Baharoth, and three Shining Spears. So it does its damage in like multiple phases. If the train is heavy, I have indirect. If the train is less heavy, I have swooping hawks and shroud runners to shoot. So it's kind of tech to be able to do anything. It also kind of means it's good on all terrains. If you want to take this to um, GW, it's good. If you want to take it to frontline, it's good. All right, so. We're kind of going in beginning of the season, but we've had a lot of changes already um, since LVO. Uh, you've already been to one event, and you're gonna—you can probably guess where I'm going with this. You've been to one event. You actually won the Cherokee Open with your Tau Empire, uh, but you're making the switch. So you—you you switch to Tau, nine and zero undefeated, haven't taken a loss yet, and you are already leaving them behind. That was kind of always the plan. Um, I was never planning on playing. Uh, Tau past Cherokee. Um, obviously, on a shooter's paradise, Tau are a very attractive proposition at Adepticon, and I am declining. And I'm saying no, thank you, sir. I put in my time. I retired undefeated and undisputed. Um, you know, basically, I will always have a higher win rate with Tau than Siegs, as long as he loses one game at some point, which is a bit of an ask, but whatever. Um, 
And that is, that's something I can just sit back on. But it was always the plan after Cherokee that Tau, Cherokee was a one and done on Tau. And I was looking forward to going back to my, going back to playing Eldar. Okay. So onward, onward and forward, leaving the greater good behind. But I do want to immediately turn around and talk about Tau first when we talk about matchups that you're considering and the play style. Um, so let, let's, let's throw it back. You're going to be playing against Tau, maybe even a particularly aggressive crisis suit heavy list similar to the one that you piloted. What would your, what would your game plan look like into this Tau army? What would your secondary choices be? And uh, how do you think that that game would go? Well, I definitely think that it is a more complicated matchup for the Eldar side of the equation, but there are plenty of, there are plenty of things that I can do to help make that matchup good. Um, I, I maintain, after having played with Tau and then against Tau, that the best way to play against Tau is to get a score lead on them and then utilize that to get a board advantage. So into Tau, um, if you are behind on the scoreboard, your way to even that up is to play a little riskier and try and be more aggressive. Tau punish that super hard. Like they will just kill you. Um, a plenty of games as Tau, when I get a score lead on my opponent, my opponent gets aggressive and handsy in order to try to even that up, and then I table them. And you don't want to be on that side of the equation. If you have a score lead on Tau, then they have to start getting aggressive, which opens them up to getting hit. Because uh, a Tau that's trying to keep the distance, trying to play defensive, very hard to close in on, very hard to aggress onto. Whereas a Tau army that's trying to come to grips with you, try and take your objectives away, trying to get aggressive at you, is way easier to handle. They're not as good at taking objectives away because they can't finish units off in combat. And if they get too close to you, they start getting charged. So their ability to push you is not as good as their ability to hold you off and prevent you from pushing them. So you want to be the one with the score lead to force a kind of game plan that you would like rather than trying to enforce a game state, trying to fix a game state after it's already gone bad. Because that's not really going to happen. So never so, let them get the upper hand. Exactly. Never let them get a score lead. It's like playing against Siegs. If you have the upper hand against Siegs, you're riding pretty. But if Siegs has the upper hand on you, you're probably, uh, you're probably already dead. So how do we get a score lead on them? Well, it involves being reliable at secondaries that be as good or better than them at primary, and having secondaries that are that cap out around the twelve to fifteen on each one of them. So this list would go stranglehold. It would go to the last. The to the last are the ten swooping hawks that fire and fade every turn, and can fire and can teleport out. When they shoot, they teleport, and you can teleport out of their SMS and airburst range, which is very nice. Yeah, that feels really important. Um, super important. Um, if they do get like a long range hit onto you, you will get fives against them. You will get five ups, five up feel no pains. So if they advance super deep to try and pick off the unit, you get five up involves, five up feel no pains. You can lightning fast. They're going to hit you on fours. So they hit you on fives with lightning fast. It's They're not realistically going to be able to kill the unit. And then they've exposed their unit. Their unit is in the center of the board. You can charge it with the avatar. You can charge it with a bunch of things. You can uh, charge it with the, the shining spears. You can smite it to death. You can shoot it with warp spiders. It opens them up to being hit. So you to the last are the swooping hawks, the avatar, which is very difficult for them to kill. and um, Eldrad, which is also super difficult to stay in the back. So that's a 15 if they don't do anything about it. Yeah, um, the Avatar's not dying to indirect casually. He might die if he's in front of the whole army, but he's not dying if you play a standoff game. They have to come get it. Yeah, and with, with Fortune, it is legitimately going to take a sizable portion of their army to put him away. Um, and so generally what you do with the Avatar in my, my brain is you... Turn one, you quicken him so that he's behind a wall in the center of the board. If your opponent ex moves deep to try and control the board or to try and hit your avatar, whatever they move fast isn't going to be able to kill him, right? You need your entire army in order to kill something as durable as the avatar of fortune. So if the avatar is behind a wall, only part of their army is going to be able to hit it. 
that's not going to do it. The avatar gets to clean that up. The rest of your army gets to clean that up. So the avatar is very durable. If he's behind a wall in the center of the board, very hard to shift. Um, especially for Tau. Like, was Tau going to get close to him? Like, please. Like, I mean, I mean, come on. Like, no. So he's a very good roadblock. He's a great roadblock against Harlequins. So we'll get there in a second. So you're to the last are great. Your stranglehold is good. So that was the last one. Well, the last one is almost certainly going to be mental interrogation. Um, you can move your Farseer on a bike up, cast mental interrogation, cast doom for one CP, and then auto miracle die a six on quicken to move 22 inches back and uh, avoid getting killed. You just do that every turn and you're staring at a 42 to 45 in the bag on secondaries. And that is very strong because they cap out at a 42 usually. And if you have a 45, if they don't do anything, you are forcing their hand. So it doesn't matter if they lose by one point or 40. If they're going to lose by one point, they have to come to you, period. Or they can just sit back and lose, which you're okay with. Okay, so kind of designed to grind out that win against Tau by just having that really good score plan. We actually talked about this in a recent Art of War episode where we had you and Clinton Johnson on after the Cherokee Open. So you're kind of building a list to follow your own blueprint of how to beat Tau. Do you at all worry about if they push on you, you think you've got the guns to to punish them? I think so. Um, Obviously, that's the point where it gets a little little more squirrely. If they're content to sit back and lose by three, then I'm content to let them. Um, But if they try and get pushy with me it does get a little it does get a little harder now there's a lot of firepower in this army if you are close to me and doom and jinx should conspire to pick up a bunch of units alongside a deluge of mortal wounds so i think the answer is yes i can uh you know we'll find out if they decide they want to push the issue I think the answer is Doom, Jinx, shoot them with the entire army. I think that they that they lose most yeah, of it. Yeah, and also, if you ever get off a good Eldritch Storm, that is not going to hurt your chances, right? Right, especially if I can get that off early, so that they're weakened when they do eventually yeah, push fine. me anyway. Okay, so, yeah, I honestly, I like the plan to Tau, and I, I think your approach is 100% correct. You don't want to beat Tau by going aggressive into them, but you have indirect, they have indirect... Uh, you both have skirmishing units. You can kill each other's skirmishing units pretty quickly. Uh, I think you're better at that because your hawks can go out and trade for skirmishing units like croutons and then leave, functioning as another indirect piece. And then your indirect is 48-inch range to their 24 to 30, meaning you probably hold the edge there and you have a little bit better choice of targets. Yep. And I think my center objective control is is just better, um, particularly because I, mean, I have all about avatar. this avatar, Jack. I really am. Like, I think the Avatar with Fortune behind a wall. Yeah, Adepticon is player place terrain, so I'll just slap a piece of terrain on the center objective if, if my opponent lets me. And I will just say, well, no matter what side I get, I'm going to put an Avatar right. on the objective behind I a like wall. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, honestly, I... Think I that's what I want to do. Yeah, I, I figured so, I was going to do. I think that's what I want to do. I also I have Sunstorm and Baharat. I knew that you, uh, you were the expert of the Tau faction so far this season, so I, I was ready to hear it. Yeah. Yep. Tell me yep. more about yep. Baharoth. Yep. I heard you say his name. Um, so Baharoth and Sunstorm together are insane obsec control. Like, if your opponent is light on obsec, they don't get objectives. Baharoth over turns one through three takes objectives over and over and over again from your opponent because he's obsec. And then turn four or five, Sunstorm runs out and does it. And you know, he's, he's a 60-point character on a bike who just shoots 26 inches across the board, throws a smite out, and then takes an objective away. He can quicken himself and move 52, so he can move the entire board and take an objective with obsec. So I have two characters that are very fast and have obsec, one of which is hard to deal with, teleports all over the entire board, and is hard to kill, and is obsec, so take objectives, kill random troops and whatnot. And the other one, turn four, turn five, just goes, no, nah, I'm taking four points away from you. I'm just doing that. I'm getting my stranglehold. I'm getting my you know, secondaries. I don't care. Boom, done. So that's incredible objective control. 
especially into armies that aren't particularly good at obsecing uh, objectives away, i.e. tower. Yeah, tower they don't have a lot of obsec. I mean, what they have is like crew and fire warriors and all those units are uh, pretty much dead to indirect, like immediately. You're going to have no trouble picking those out early. And then if they just leave one spot yeah. for a jetpack to move on, they do have that command phase ability to to make a unit obsec, a crisis unit. But I think that's only from a specific kind of commander, which not every list is taking that guy. It is. It's on an enforcer commander, um, which is, in my opinion, the third best out of the three. Uh, it's still really good, obviously. It's a uh, Tau commander, has yeah, a bunch of guns, and bad. it's it's durable. But it is never bad. Uh, Siegs is experimenting with including it instead of a Cold Star. If you don't see an Enforcer, your objective control is just better than theirs. If you do see an Enforcer, you have to play around the ability of a Crisis unit to turn OBSEC. So you want to take an objective maybe in their backfield or something that doesn't have a Crisis suit team on it. Or it doesn't have a unit in range of the enforcer. Remember, Sunstorm can move fifty-two inches, so every objective uh, yeah, is on what, the table. He moves twenty. Moves. He moves twenty. He still has the auto advance six, and then he can quicken himself. I think, and I think he can advance is, off the quicken. Normal move so now, but I'm gonna be honest: forty-six six. inches probably still enough. I, I think you get to advance off it if you want to double check that. But um, yeah. I mean, I think forty-six I'm not would be enough. The details on that one. But just getting in, yeah, just getting into the fifties feels nice, you know. Uh, but I think you do get to make an advance as part of it. But I don't have the book in front of me. You do, um, so I will. Like you you know, know. Better than we'll Look at that. Um, <laughs> fifty-two. You can fifty-two. You can advance as part of it. Yeah, so fifty-two inches, and you can make sure it goes off. So you can have him rock it from one quarter of the board to the other. Every objective is on the table, so that means he can't. I, generally, they can't cover every single one of them with a crisis suit team in range of a, an enforcer commander. So you can take them away. Yeah, and of course, you know whichever Feels one pretty, they try to protect with obsec, you can always um, blow away the uh, blow away those idiots with the indirect. Right? You've got those options. Exactly. Exactly. So um, the other thing is um, their screens. You can kill their screens with your indirect because the indirect's 48 inch range for some reason. So you kill all their crew towns and their crew. And that means that the only stuff they have left are real units. So your warp spiders actually go in reserves and they teleport down onto the board and they just shoot a million shots into a unit that you preferably throw doom onto. All of a sudden they're yeah, looking pretty I, dead to me. The, no, I'm, I'm with it. I think uh, that's the hope. I think taking the, the shadow, uh, shadow weavers. Uh, the indirect batteries over the the extra night spinners here really helps your ability to clear out the cheap chaff very very quickly, and just force the issue rather than trying to hammer the the big stuff early. You just force it out. That's always been the best use for indirect, as long as it's not like like um, what are they called? Hive guard, right? Hive guard are good into everything, so you don't want to waste your time with chaff. But a lot of indirect is. Uh, a lot of indirect is only good into weaker units, like especially now when it doesn't have rerolls. Like night spinners aren't going to do real work into um, into a crisis unit. It'll take some time for it to really sink in. So I can hurt a crisis unit. I can peel the drones and maybe kill a guy over a turn or two. But what I really want to do is I just want to clear all the crew and all the crew towns over two turns. And then all of a sudden they have to start putting crisis units on objectives. It's no fun. It really isn't. Especially since in Ultway you can get the Shadow Weavers plus one to hit. It's why there's two batteries of three instead of three units of two. It's so that put one CP plus one to hit on the Shadow Weavers. And then one CP reroll to hit if they're if the target's within twelve inches of the five ah, rangers. Okay, place. that's kind of spicy too. So one unit could reroll hits. One unit could have plus one to hit. Uh, nasty. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. I like this plan to exactly, tell. I think exactly. uh, I think I think the plan's a good one. All right, you ready to talk about the uh, the other half of the the big menace in the meta right now? Killer clowns. No, custodies. Killer clowns. You forgot them already? You literally played them at a tournament like two months ago and you've already forgotten Custodes. I'm very well, worried we're still about, talking about Clowns, Custodes to be honest with you. Uh, Custodes? 
custodians are can always be a problem because they're if you just don't have enough damage to make them respect you or they decide that they want to roll four ups instead of one through threes um they can just be a big just a big fist just punching you in the face over and over again like they can just run down the center of the board and just run you over or they can just be a lot of infantry standing on objectives so that's certainly a potential issue if there are a lot of bikes obviously the whole obsec baharoth sunstorm blah 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 is very nice um but let's look at what happens if you know they are a more balanced list right so something like ryan snyder's list which is a lot of offense but not a lot of obsec i would try to attack it from the obsec angle because i'm out shooting it is difficult the list puts out offense but obsec Baharov can run onto an objective and it's just mine. Sunstorm can run on objective and it's just mine. Uh, a lot of Sony's lists that aren't Ryan Snyder's, which by the way, I have a deep appreciation for Ryan Snyder's list. It puts out shots. Um, but to Sony's lists that aren't Ryan Snyder's tend to run a lot of obsec troops. So we have to deal with those. And it's hard to take objectives back because they count as two models. So it's just kind of annoying um that's where jinx is going to come into play like jinxing a unit of bikes and then lighting it up with a whole bunch of ap0 making them take three ups is quite nice so i feel like i can kill bikes between a bunch of ap2 off the warp spiders and a bunch of ap0 with jinx and a bunch of mortal wounds and a bunch of indirect platforms i think i can deal with bikes um the avatar as well really helps i, I think i can handle bikes uh, what, what do you think about me being able to handle yeah, like I nine actually, bikes? I think the bikes are to move a down easier the thing for you to kill because of um, just you know just because of the profiles. You know, you already wound them on fours with all of your strength six scatter laser shots and the strength six indirect, so it's not that effective for them to transhuman against things like night spinners. So they'll probably let you just wound on threes with the one night spinner because it's it's barely worth a CP at that point. Um, you know, you just honestly just having. Even, like, you know, obviously, if you if you doom a unit, they kind of have to save no rerolls for that, which means everything else that you shoot just gets to use its free reroll, just chip, 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 chip. Jinx and them not getting cover means that the weight of dice should break through. I, I fully agree with that. If they're shadow keepers for the minus one strength, the scatter lasers will be worse. The mortal wounds will be more effective. Kind of a side grade, in my opinion. I think you're. I think that both Emperor's Chosen or Shadow Keepers would be uh, equally defensive into you, just because you have you know a couple different ways to do damage. Um. I the dreadnoughts in the infantry are actually what scares me most. I worry about the T7 dreadnoughts because you have nothing that's anything other than damage one into them. That's and true. wounding on you have a lot. That's of true. It. I do have a lot. But of damage it, though, one. But I if agree. you're wounding on fives, I agree. You just might not get the volume through. I do agree with that. Um, I think that a bunch of dreadnoughts is poised to make a resurgence out of custodies honestly um like a lot of galatis dreads that sort of thing i do think my one of my biggest advantages into custodies in general is the avatar with fortune he yeah, very, just, damage he just does instead not die of minus one damage he just he's just die. as good into the two damage stuff and a lot better into the uh the big lances yeah, like a 3 plus D3, if they roll uh, 1 on that D3, it suddenly becomes 2 damage. And then I have 5 of Film of Pain against it from Fortune. So the, the Avatar just kind of doesn't die against them. In combat especially, because all their combat becomes 2 damage. If it's a lot of infantry and a lot of bikes, I can kind of... I can quicken them up behind a piece of terrain in the center. And then as I work on the bikes... You can just kind of walk around the board being uncontested because salvo launchers actually don't put them away that fast, surprisingly enough. Um, you know, they wound him on fours, he has a four up invul, and I have a reroll on that. I have fate dice for saves, like it just it just doesn't put him away that fast. It has damage on a five of film of pain. Uh, so and in combat, they just they just cannot kill me. So that's one of my biggest advantages. He just walks around just slapping. Like he'll just walk into a shield guard unit and just start hitting. Um, and then they also have to turn off doom in combat. So if I doom something and then I shoot at it a little and they turn off rerolls into it, right? Then I charge it with the avatar. They have to turn off rerolls again. Yeah, so trying to or else I get to reroll wounds. Possible. So exactly. it does help to bleed the most secret. Exactly. 
And if I charge something with the Shining Spears as well, then all of a sudden, like, I'm getting reroll to hit and wounds somewhere. Yeah, that's pretty nasty. Okay. You know. Um, uh, um, obviously, it can go horribly wrong if they just decide they're rolling 80% or 95% to um, is also a problem. There's, there's, that would also be a problem if they decided that they wanted to do that. But hopefully, they don't realize that's just an option. Um, you know, that they can just decide to do that at any point. At least that's what it feels like when I play against custodians. They just snap their fingers and they decide, I'm rolling 80% four ups today. Um, also, I think warp yeah, spiders are six, really good in two, infantry. Kind of in, like, if they're going after infantry, it's hard to do the transhuman there. It's hard to justify it, I should say. But it adds up really well. It really is. Because you have enough shots. Yeah. And then they can't really do anything about it. Because you shoot them, you battle focus 2d6, so you're kind of hovering at like where they would need a long charge to get to you. And if they charge you, you just move six inches. So they can't, like, a, infantry can't deal with warp spiders. They just get to shoot all game. And if you just let warp spiders shoot you all game, you're probably a sad pony. Okay, so kind of the game plan then is, you know, I mean, against custodians, it's pretty common to, like, spread out, spread around the edges. Uh, again, secondaries. What uh, what are we thinking here in custodies? Well, to the last. Well, to the last, custodies aren't particularly good at digging out your to the lasts. I like the only army that would be decent at it would be the nine bikes, which I'm less concerned about. Um, but even so, like Eldred tucked in the back, the avatar kind of doesn't die. Swooping hawks jump out, shoot, and then teleport to a safe position, like. It's still hard to deal with them. I would take to the last. Stranglehold, probably not good. This is probably where I would take engage and then just start jamming vipers into quarters. I can't guarantee I'm going to get stranglehold every turn. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's yeah, the really they hold like the objectives. The, the where you want to have the so, engage. Because if you can just flat advance them behind the wall, it's kind of inconvenient to go kill them when they're not contributing to primary at all. Because, you know, Custodies don't have any indirect, and they don't have a lot of uh, they don't have a ton of units to, like go out and do things and trade with. Like every unit has to have a, a job it's doing. God, just compare a viper to a land speeder storm, want. just real fast, just real fast. Yeah, it's because you love your land speeder storms, and I get that. It it just moves. Yep. What does it move? Sixteen. Uh, land speeder storms move sixteen or fourteen. Quick, but it's. But yeah. Points. They're quick, but they're fifteen points cheaper. Have significantly have more shooting. Um, yeah, vipers of storms have four. T five right. storm is T six, so it and offsets a little. They do, and yeah, and six it's wounds instead of seven. Big part here. Shoots harder, it's cheaper. It's the fifteen. Shoots harder, and it's fifteen. It's the fifteen. Shoots harder, and it's fifteen points cheaper. Is really the crazy part. Um, yeah, vipers are quite quite nice for that just i don't care about you go across the center line and get me engaged go on to an objective and get me points go screen something out so i think into custody like none of these plans have been i'm going to do a then b then c then win they're all like here are the advantages i can try to exploit and i'm going to try and craft a game plan in the moment that uses them which against top 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 tier armies is the most you can expect they're also going to have the same sort of thing against you where they're not going to have a, you know, a five step plan that just yields them a win every single time. And against top tier armies, it's not reasonable yeah, no, to expect no that. S tier army right now ha is like, has such big flaws that you can just a hundred percent beat it every single time. Exactly. If they, yep. if they did, they wouldn't be S two, and we wouldn't be worrying about them as much. Yep. Um, I think the the next one up is yeah, killer clowns. That would be I'm more than ready to talk about the, the clowns. Um, yes. Well, partly that's because you are actually taking yeah. the, uh, the the laughing god or whatever. Uh, the uh, Hegerite, servants of the Hegerite, laughing god. I've never really been sure how to pronounce the fictional. Uh, I, I always just pronounce it Chegarak or like yes. uh, like these <laughs> Scottish or whatever. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. I, I mean, I think Harlequins are really really good, and we're going to see them a lot at tournaments. Um. Yeah, you know, unfortunately for this episode, my list is long yes. and written, so uh, a little bit less of a process to go through. We thought Jack would be more fun. Um, and it was. And it was. Honestly, I did not have a list before we 
designed it. Now I do. Really and I'm very excited. I don't want to play it, it myself. Get the avatar on the table. Yeah, listen, you play it. Yeah, listen, you play it. You uh, test it out for me. You decide you like it better. Ooh, I play Harley Quinn. Right. I do control I'm sad. the molecules. You do have the control of the molecules. because <laughs> I am in New Jersey right, and well, you are in Florida. Let's talk about the matchup, though. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the matchup. We, we don't really let's know talk about what the Psyduff so, is going to be a, the yeah. one for Harley Quinn's. I don't even think there's going to be a, the one. I think that there's just legitimate choices to be made on Dark versus Light versus Twilight. Yeah. And they all are going to present unique challenges. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. They're, yeah, they're all good, for sure. So against light, I don't shoot as good unless I'm close to you. I hit on fours, which, oh, wait, look at that. I hit on fours no matter what. So I don't really care about that, um, particularly against boats. I just want to hit no rerolls on the star weavers and the void weavers. It means I'm hitting on fours just with a massive quantity of shots. Um, kind of takes and that's really the equation, what we're and then for. your pluses to hit don't help. But it's a CP, so just not spending the CP isn't like really burning your resources. It's just a resource you're not going to have the choice to use. Yeah, especially since what would happen normally would be I would hit on a four, so I could activate a plus one. But if I do that, then they activate a minus one, and it washes. So they activate lightning fast reactions, and all of a sudden I'm back to a four, but we traded the CP, and I'm probably not willing to do that. So. Yeah, so hitting on four is not the biggest deal. Honestly, the scariest part is how mobile they are with their guns. So they are there; they can move twenty-two inches and fire the void weavers, which is very scary. Um, so I do have to zone, try and zone them out, make them worry that I'm going to kill them if they try and run at me. So if they do try and run at me, that's going to be an eldritch storm, and just try and drop like twenty-five mortal wounds on their army out of that. Although, at D3 um, plus two, with only two Farseers, you do lose that potential to kill a boat. You cannot kill a boat with Eldritch Storm. I do. You're going to hurt do. a it lot is... of boats, potentially, but you're not going to kill any. Yeah. I, I do agree that, that, unfortunately, I think I had to give up that third Farseer. Um, the way to include it would be to get rid of the Avatar, so I have the slots left open. Um, that's a different list entirely. Fortunately, I think the Avatar does actually help me out quite significantly in this matchup. It is hard for Harlequins to... I mean, it's hard for every army to kill the Avatar, but it is hard for Harlequins to do it, especially if it's behind terrain in the center of the board. They're terrible at killing it in combat. Like, truly atrocious. It has a... Yeah, it has a two-up save, so even if they ignore invulns against the dark, I'm getting a 5-0. Okay. And they have to spend two CP for the privilege of making me have a five up instead of a four up. And in addition, they're wounding me on sixes most of the time. Yeah, he's T8. Uh, Harlequins are strength four in combat. Yup. So they're wounding me on sixes. And they're not re rolling any of that. And I have a five up, feel no pain. And I have a sweep attack. So I, I feel like the avatar is just going to take a pound of flesh every turn. And the Harlequin player is going to try and ignore him. So it, he's a massive roadblock in the center of the board, which is fantastic for me. Um, so between Eldritch Storm and the, uh, the Avatar, the idea is those prevent them from just taking every boat in their army and throwing them straight down the pipe at me. Which is the thing I'm scared of. I can't kill boats at speed. So... I need to keep them from just taking their army and jamming it in the center and then jamming it into my army the following turn. And Eldritch Storm and the Avatar at least make them take a turn to try and like avoid getting hit by that. Yeah, that's that's it. Buys me some time. Um in addition, I have multiple smites. I can one CP cast like Doom on a big void weaver squad before shooting it. Or I can cast Crushing Orb, which is pretty good. Or, if, you know, if there's one one Void Weaver on one wound, I can cast Executioner or something on it and get 2d3 more wounds, whatever I can dream. Um, also, Crushing Orb into Smite Smite into Executioner is just good into those units. Like, they don't like Mortal Wounds. So that does help my offense into them somewhat. Um, Doom plus scatter lasers, Doom plus swooping hawks is very good at cleaning up 
uh, boats. And then the indirect is good for either polishing off a boat that's at one wound or two wounds or whatever, or it just picks up units that are on that got out of a destroyed boat. I can't kill that many boats in one turn unless they just cluster them all and let me nuke them with a um, with an Eldritch Storm. But what I can do is pick off you know two boats, three boats, and then fire my indirect at the stuff that just got out. And over a couple of turns of doing that, they're not going to have that much of an army left. Um, I also have really good objective control between Sunstorm and Ahara, so like I can try and play that game as well. What they have is raw power, and that's it's unfortunate to see the raw power angle, but, but also they have it. Unfortunately, they have a lot of speed. Uh, I have an in a, most armies actually, pretty much all armies have an inability to kill a relevant number of boats in one turn. Mm-hmm. I think most you can do it over two or three. Yeah, I think every army struggles with that, to be honest with you. Um, pretty much the the way that the boat's defenses work out, between luck of the laughing god, re-rolls, four up and bowl across the board, minus one to hit, no re-rolls, four up to hit only. What it means is that there is a gate on how much damage you can pump into a Harlequin army in one turn. You can table a Harlequin over your army over five turns, but tabling a Harlequin army in one, or tripling a Harlequin army in one turn is almost impossible for basically any army. So you need to find ways to slow them down and give you more turns to, to dump damage into them to make them not as much of a threat. So that's where Eldritch Storm as a threat and the uh, Avatar come in to just be like, nah, stop. Um, kind of some of the questions that I have for you uh, actually is, what is your plan for primary? So you've kind of talked about what you want to do to get, you know, get rid of the Harlequins. But um, first of all, what's your, you know, what's your secondary plan? What's your primary plan? Because Harlequins, I, I agree, you can send out an obsec bike find some uh, an objective that doesn't have troops on it, only boats, and be like, aha, now you don't get these primary points. Great. How are you holding primary against them, is my question. Um, well, that's, that's less of a concrete plan and more try and look at the situation and see what I can do to get points out of it. Um, I do have some, some board bullying, well, one board bullying unit, that would be the avatar. The avatar can kind of camp an objective and, you know, take his pound of flesh every turn. If you try and contest it, fall back and charge. If you try and tie him up, so you probably won't try and tie him up. Things like that. Um, generally, it will be put a viper on an objective and shoot everything on that objective to death. Is That's usually how that plan will work. Um, put something non-committal out there. So that you don't get too much out of me putting it there. Um, and then use my firepower to just clear the objective. And then Bahroth and Sunstorm as an objective uh, taking duo. Sunstorm usually will take, in my head, would take an objective towards the end of the game. And Bahroth takes them towards the beginning of the game. So Sunstorm will take it like turn four or five. And Bahroth will be a nuisance taking objectives turns one, two, and three. And between that, it's just jerks taking your objectives over and over again. Hopefully. Yeah. It, it sounds really annoying. I, the, the double obset character sounds uh, literally twice as hard to deal with. And especially the fact that that Sunstorm Warlock is so fast. I feel like I just accept that I'm down four points on primary and you're going to choose when I lose them. Exactly. I'm just going to choose the end of the game so you'd get. So you, I get the most value out of having the Warlock, and then I cash it in for points at the end of the game after I've already cast a spell four times or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Turn four, he um, and dies, you know, for, for Kane, whatever. Exactly. Um, also, having two squads of Warp Spiders is, like, really nice in the matchup. They're good in the Harlequins. Like, they're AP2, which literally does not matter, but everything else about them is great. They shoot, they then move 2d6 inches, when you charge them, they move a further six. 
they're annoying. They're plenty of shots. They're strength six, so they wound boats on threes. They wound the infantry on twos. They can relevantly overwatch. Like they're just jerks. They're annoying. Yeah, no, not not a fan. They of can all. stand in terrain, so they overwatch on fives with a lot of shots. Like they're they're a real annoyance for sure. Um, they're quite good. Um, wire weave grenades are quite good off of the uh, shroud runners, which is partly why I wanted them. Shroud runners also natively hit on twos, so the most they can, unless your unless your opponent is light, the most that they can degrade the shroud runners to hitting on is threes, which is a lot more reliable than hitting on two and then hitting on fours. And then you can doom a target. So you're hitting on threes and then you're re-rolling to wound, which does certainly help. Yeah. Okay. I can I, I can see it coming up. Like I mean I've I've seen enough Eldar stuff on the table to appreciate that they can incredibly kill Harlequins. Uh for me it's really that question of holding your own primary and surviving. Uh and you know, as you said, it's a matter of buying time so that you get to work, right? I, I think that you've accepted yeah, that exactly. this isn't a one turn job that you can credibly pull off. Yeah, I'm probably going to be sacrificing some points in the early game in order to have more turns. I need to make the game longer. If the game, if the relevant turns of the game last two turns, right, it's just violence for the first two turns and then someone's dead and someone's not, and the person who's not dead wins, I'm probably going to be the person who's dead. Yeah, you feel. I don't think two turns is really going to do it. Exactly. But if the game goes five turns with both armies, like, in each other if the game goes five turns i'm probably won. so i need to or i'm probably more likely to win than they are so what i need to do is i need to delay i need to stretch the game out i need to roadblock them i need to seed points early in order to preserve resources so i can continue to dump damage into them and then at a certain point like they're going to run out of troops Right, because I'm killing boats, killing troops, killing boats, killing troops, killing boats, killing troops. At a certain point, they run out of troops. And Void Weavers can't realistically take back the game by themselves. That's when Bahra starts running out onto objectives. That's when you know I start committing Sunstorm. That's when I start sprinting all my units out into the open, because you can shoot me, but that's not going to get the job done by itself. Yeah, and hopefully you're doing you know? it after you've kind of thinned down my ability to deal with multiple units all at once. Exactly. exactly. Everything that lives it's, it's certainly a game. Harlequins are very strong, and they are a big threat. And if you you can underestimate them at your peril, uh, for sure. I'm deeply worried about them, actually. But I think this list has tools to work with. Um, having a lot of minus to charge is actually really annoying. Like, you charge the rangers, and you take D3 mortal wounds that are minus 2 to charge. That's not fun at all. You charge anything, or you, you charge with a unit that's within 12 inches of the Shroud Runners, you take D3 mortal wounds, or minus D3, you charge. That's no fun. So, you know, that, that's actually really annoying when you get a unit out, right? Like, you get out a Troop Master. Well, Troop Master is a bad example. He's foot in the future, so he goes plus a million. But like, you get out of Solitaire, and you have to make a six, where all of a sudden it became a nine. And you failed, and now I'm going to shred you with shooting, and you just lost a resource for free. And I took a couple or, more. Or you're going to in, in my own charges. And you well, exactly. Um, you either took D3 off the wire weave net, or you took one because it unfortunately caps for the number of models in a unit off wire weave grenades. But like, if I wire weave grenades a unit of Harlequin troops and I roll three, that charge does not happen. It doesn't happen because it's minus three to charge and you need to roll plus three over what you need to. But the main reason is I just gutted the squad. Um, three mortal wounds on a Harlequin troop unit is gutting the ability of that squad to do anything. So it makes combat. The combat is negligible, and then I pick them up. And that's not something an elite army can just accept. Yeah, I, I do actually, I will say I'm, you know, I'm very annoyed that you have all of the little splash mortals in there. Because that is absolutely what I didn't want to see. But, you know what, we were trying to make the best list we could, so I couldn't steer you awry, although I really wanted you to do something else with those five points. Yeah. yeah. I think the Ranger... I mean, I mean I'm really... I, I do like it. Um, another thing you can think about putting in the list is um, Falku's Wing. 
just another d3 mortal wounds um you move over some it makes your warlock on foot move faster and if you move over something you do d3 mortal wounds which is just good if you find yet another way to just get a little splash mortal wound in also a good way to take out rival exactly. lords just saying it certainly is movement phase oh look at that you just took three um also, the swooping hawks moving over a transport and just dropping five, you get a little lucky, six mortal wounds on it, and just killing it outright is super strong. Yeah, if you can never super, pull that super off, super strong. That's gonna, be, that's gonna be game shifting for sure. So I like the I like the splash mortal wounds. I really do. You know, on a four plus, the shining spears will do D three mortal wounds to you. The rangers do D three mortal wounds to you. One CP does D three mortal wounds to you. Uh, I have Smites, I have Executioner, I have um, Crushing Orb. You know, it, it's it's a lot for Harlequins to deal with if I get to do it multiple turns. I feel like this Weight of Mortals will also make you very powerful into other Eldar. You know, I know we don't always talk about like the literal mirror match, but into other Eldar, if you can do a bunch of Mortals, they will chew through other Eldar very quickly. Especially as we see a lot of people go custom instead of build, um, not build town, I apologize, instead of Ulthway, where you have that built in mortal defense. Um, if you generate a lot of mortals and you have mortal defense yourself, you're never going to be the one losing that battle. You know, it may be a tie if you're exactly. if you play against Ulthway, but into a custom craft world mirror, I feel like that could be a, a definitive edge where you can very easily kill their Phoenix Lords and you can very easily kill their Warp Spider other units, whereas yours may last a little longer. Exactly, exactly. Um, we're also seeing a lot of custodies, we're talking about custodies. Um, we're seeing a lot of them go shadow keepers. Uh, more and more people are going shadow keepers, and if you play into a shadow keeper's opponent, you can start melting them with mortal wounds. Like all these incidental ones are not a joke against guys who have 50 point models. Yeah, if you happen to hit, you know, the three on that D3 mortals and you just kill a custodian. That, that's already a huge swing when it is only a three model unit. Now it's so much easier right. to kill and that's the part where they're going to do so much less damage, they're going to hold objectives less efficiently. Like, that's the point where your Farseer might just not cast Doom, honestly, and just goes Crushing Orb, Execution, or Smite. And just, just you know, Eldrad goes Smite, Farseer goes Smite, Crushing Orb, Execution, or Warlock goes Smite instead of Quicken. And all of a sudden, you picked up an entire bike squad. You know, yeah, that would, you know, hawks move over and drop five mortal wounds on them. And then you wire weave grenades them and do D3. And then shining screws do D3 potentially. And it, it adds up real fast into, even into, you know, Emperor's Chosen, but into Shadow Keepers, it's crippling. Mm -hmm. Nasty, nasty stuff. Um, you know, I know we, we probably aren't going to spend too much time on Crusher Stampede because uh, we know that there's a new Tyranid Codex around the around the corner. But Crusher Stampede uh, in the current Codex is definitely a thing uh, at Adepticon. Uh, I feel like that weight of mortals is going to be very important in that matchup as well. Mortal wounds are one of the better ways to deal with Crusher. For sure, for sure. So that's, I mean, that's my number one game plan for damage output. There's a lot of three-up armor saves there, so Doom plus a lot of AP zero, Jinx plus a lot of AP zero, like Doom and Jinx on a target just picks them up. And then you drop mortal wounds elsewhere. I mean, they can kill you if they touch you, which is unfortunate. But if you can delay them for a couple turns, they just won't have an army left, and that really helps. Yeah, and just any way you can um, also crush is going to be yeah. valuable. Exactly. And also turn one, you just drop the Night Spinner and the six Shadow Weavers into their um, into their Hive Guard, and you just try and pick a couple of them up and make it so that they don't want to Exploding Sixes double shoot them. It's just not efficient anymore, and suddenly their biggest tool against you is basically gone. Yeah, I, I could... It's, still, it's not still not great on Adepticon terrain. If they go first and just jam their army straight down the pipe at you, like it's not good. But you have a lot of play there. Yeah, I, I, I think that you actually I would actually say you have a favorable matchup into Crusher. Uh you know, as much Probably, as it, one yeah. can ever say it, because if Crusher goes first and rolls a couple five ups, uh everyone's in trouble. But you know, barring that one obvious condition that they can kind of just put on anyone if the dice go right, 
I feel like you have all the tools you could ask for. You have some cheap units to screen. You are very fast yourself to get around the table once you've taken out some of their speed elements. So you're very hard to pin in yourself. Uh, you have good mortal wound output. You have good damage into the monsters. You have a weight of damage one with rerolls. One of the best ways to kill the monsters quickly. Um, and then uh, mortal wounds out, out the butt. Like the Shining Spear unit, so good into monsters. Just going in there, rerolling everything with that Exarch. He by himself, you know, 50% chance of D3 mortals. He's probably going to average like four or five mortal wounds and also like, you know, like three failed saves. Like he probably, I would guess that the Shining Spear Exarch shooting in combat probably kills like half of a Demacaron by himself. Probably, yeah. And then he has buddies with him too. Like it's not out of the, not out of the question that a unit of Shining Spears by themselves just kill the Demacaron. I think that's a little aggressive because the, the buddies are just not nearly as good at it. But if you right. saw right. it's some not slides, out of the, I, it's, it's not out of the question is what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Yeah, it could happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it could happen. But more likely that they do like 10 to 12 wounds to it. That's still really good. <laughs> yeah, from a relatively cheap unit that's easy to hide, you know, easy to stop them from getting the first strike on, that is important. Also, also, wire weave grenades to make their charges suck are very helpful. Yep, yeah, from both the Shroud Runners and the Rangers, that's really good, uh, good uh, screening and good move blocking units. Put that in a forest here's, too. Here's a question for you. Here's a question for you, John. With the importance of incidental mortal wounds, do we want to swap out the weeping stones on my footlock for um, Faku's wing? I don't think that that guy's going to be flying over enough people matter it's cute i don't hate it is it good my vote is no but you 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 could make the swap and i wouldn't be like mad about it It does make him move faster normally and move like he has fly but the weeping stones is basically an extra look at a strands of fate die so i would tend to agree with you a strands of fate is so we haven't actually talked about it that much but it's such a strong mechanic for the army that i want every buff that i can have on it i want that ordinarily um, you look at six a turn and keep four, and this army looks at seven a turn and keeps five with two rerolls. So you look at nine a turn and keep five. It's very strong. And yeah, and yeah, and you've got the two rerolls as well. Yeah, so you functionally look at nine dice because whatever two dice you weren't going to keep, you reroll. And so you get to see functionally nine dice a turn, and you get to keep five of them with the uh, Fate Reader World of Trade on Eldrad. So it's it's very strong, uh, honestly. It's it's super strong. You get to look at initial die, which is probably it pays off every single turn. Likely better than the one turn a game where you get D three mortals and the slight movement benefit. But it is Falku's wing is definitely very strong. Um, Relic. If I didn't, if I had a second footlock instead of uh, the bike guy, I would probably, I would almost certainly be taking Falco's wing on him. Yeah, I, I could see it if you if you ran double footlock. Yeah, or if you're running a foot farseer, Falco's wing is very good on as well. Um, but I like the if you only have one farseer, I really like having it on bikes. So you can quicken it and do insane psychic shenanigan plays. Yeah, yeah, you'll get out of there real quickly. Okay, I dig it, I dig it. Um, so match of we have other? talked about... Your fear in here? Um, in terms of other matchups, those are the big ones, obviously. Um, anything with a lot of indirect, I could have some problems with. Yeah, anyone that can go We've already right covered quickly. those. Exactly. Um, so we've covered most of them that I'm worried about. And Guard, I think, has a real tough time with uh, lightning fast reactions. But even so, Guard pump out a lot of shots. There is that hilarious thing tank. where like, Guard are not a well-rounded army at all. But literally anything in the game has to kind of ask itself, like, okay, if I play against one of the three guard players who are, like, actually decent, and they go first, if they roll a little above average, do I just lose? And you, you kind of need to make sure that you can just weather at least one turn and get through. And I think you can, if I'm being honest. I really do. I think I, think I can. Um, I think I can. I think 
even if I like, I think the avatar can just straight up avatar plus characters can kind of just walk through that. That that's probably true, honestly. <laughs> um, I mean, I can't I can't walk down the throats of three Lehman Russes, but like, I can kind of go from cover to cover, and the indirect is not going to kill that. So that does help. Um, Drukhari is obviously always a threat. Drukhari plus Harlequin is always a threat. Um, but I think if anyone is going to be good into Drukhari, it's going to be Eldar. A lot of mortal wounds. It's going to hurt them quite badly. A lot of, you know, low AP shooting is also going to just kind of chew them, chew them off the board. Yeah, that weight of dice. So I feel good. fairly confident. Exactly. exactly. Feel fairly confident to that. I would much rather play Drukhari Harlequins than pure Harlequins, I think. Because if they're Drukhari Harlequins, they obviously have less. They don't have that critical mass of Harlequins that makes it so that you just straight up cannot deal with them in like one to two turns. Okay, yeah. I um, Honestly, I, I really think I can see that. Yeah, it... Uh, I, I don't really... I can't really think of other armies that I would have a problem with. Although I'm sure, you know, round four of Adepticon, I'm going to pair into some weird off-meta army that, you know, I never even thought of. And I'm going to have an unexpectedly hard time with it. That's just kind of what happens at tournaments. It's one of the best parts of playing at tournaments. It happens every time. I just have to accept that that's going to happen. And obviously, neither I nor anyone else can be Blood Angels. So, you know, I just have to accept that. Oh, no, obviously. Who, who could ever do that? Who could? Who could? Um, yeah, I, I do think it's a well-rounded army. It is heavily jank reliant. So I, and I do think if you make a serious mistake, you lose a critical piece of your army. So your positioning has to be on point. Yeah. I like, I think, like, I think, yeah, if you misposition Baharoth, if you have perfect positioning on Baharoth and like, you can find the perfect place to put him down. I think he's near immortal. But if you are off in the positioning, he just dies. If your opponent can get damage on him in a phase you were not expecting, all of a sudden they commit and kill him, and he's just dead. Yeah, I could really uh, see like um, one random psychic power that just does a little better than it should. Um, you know, like all you know, all those random like silly powers that you look at and you say this is a worse smite, but then your opponent takes it and he hits the three loopholes that actually let him get D three mortal wounds, and of course it's the three. And now Baharoth is like an actual danger. Like that can just happen. Yeah, exactly. And now you can't like exactly. Baharoth the same way, or he might just die on the spot. Yeah. He sort of, he almost has um, Celestine's ability. He kind of does, but it's for three wounds instead of, you know, a full six again. Um, once he's burned through his first three wounds, he's a different beast. Like he's just not as good, unfortunately. Um, he's still good, still fast, he's still obsec, he's still a great skirmisher. But when he's at full health, your opponent doesn't even want to commit to him because they know they're not going to kill him. Yeah, that, that is one of the things. And if they leave it too long, then then they literally leave it too and they long. Just, and suddenly they've run out of places yeah. to do it. You you have to exactly. accept that you're going to do three wounds, not accomplish anything else, and then make your life easier for later. Exactly. Exactly. So if your positioning is off on Baharoth, you're going to get punished. If your positioning is off on the Hawks, they'll get killed. If your positioning is off on other stuff, it will get killed. But if your positioning is good, then the list just should, theoretically, again, I haven't played this. I've played, like, what, one practice game with the Eldar, maybe two, before I left for New Jersey. It was a substantially different list. And that was a couple weeks ago. So I'm going into Adepticon with functionally almost no practice. Mm -hmm. And no but, pressure. Right? Uh, no pressure. But hey, when I won Cherokee, I had zero practice games with Tau before I played my first game. No reason you can't so, do it you know, again. No reason I can't do it again. My bad decisions will never catch up to me, John. That's not the way this works. Uh, I lo love the confidence, but... Uh... Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see how it goes for you. I'm really excited to see how this list does at Adepticon. Uh, I'm hoping this is what you bring because I I'm a big fan of this list. I'm glad we got to try it together because I I think it's a winner. Uh, yeah, I I I do think this is what I'm going to take basically point for point, if not point for point. Mm -hmm. 
I I honestly can't wait to see it. So all right, all right. I think I think we'll see in the finals. We've bud. we've talked about this list. We've talked about your plan to the top meta armies. Uh, you've got so many tools. Uh, I'm really excited to see how you execute it. Hopefully, you'll even make it onto some of the stream games um, that are at Adepticon, so that uh, some of the people can watch watch how it's done. Uh, good luck to you at Adepticon. Uh, obviously, we'll be we'll be there together. I'll be bringing my Harlequins. You'll be bringing your Craft World Eldar. Uh, if we meet, may the best elf win. All right. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. We will catch you next time on the next episode of The Art of War. Until then, take care. Goodbye. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com. <laughs>